I'm going to talk to you a little bit about orthostatic intolerance. You can see that uh, it varies uh, between people fainting at, uh, at attention, which is a very common thing if you've never uh, heard of this before. Um, you have a big group of armed forces at attention for any length of time. There'll always be one or two of them faint. Very embarrassing. Some people think for other reasons that are not orthostatic intolerance, typical vasovagal fainting. For instance, it can be triggered by a, uh, a big male, meal eating that. It can be uh, uh, triggered by straining uh, to urinate or defecate. Um, cough um, is a, another, paroxysms of cough can cause vasovagal syncope. And um, um, swallowing cold things can do it as well. So there's a whole lot of things that can cause fainting, but we're going to be interested in this talk in, uh, primarily on orthostatic, meaning standing up. Simple as that. And, you know, in the beginning, people fainted. There are a couple of biblical quotes in there about people who fainted. Um, and we're, you know, we don't know a whole hell of a lot more today than we knew about then. Uh, but uh, we're less, less likely to be mad at God for fainting anyway. <clears throat> so you can see some notable things on this slide and as things have progressed uh, to, uh, to this uh, uh, last century. But the one thing I wanted to point out of, of some interest to me uh, uh, personally, having been in the Army, is um, de Costa's description of Civil War vets and Thomas Lewis's the description of uh, fainting in young soldiers during the First World War. And for all intents and purposes, the symptoms which they outline perfectly in their publications are of, of uh, POTS and neurally mediated hypotension. Neurally mediated hypotension is orthostatic uh, uh, drop in blood pressure or heart rate and, and, and fainting from that. And then one wonders whether today these are all be termed uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome and how much of that is, is really these, these disorders. <clears throat> the first clinical trial, uh, or not a trial, first clinical use of um, a tilt table test were, was uh, in, in relatively uh, recent times, in uh, 1986. And uh, th this is a group from England who did this primarily to see how many people fainted because of a drop in blood pressure as opposed to a drop in heart rate. Now I'll show you both can occur so that when people faint when they're standing up, um, it could either be from a drop in heart rate or a drop in blood pressure. And these uh, investigators thought that they could determine who, who would benefit from a pacemaker, that is those who fainted from a, a drop in heart rate, and, and who won't. And, and they made their initial um, decisions on that uh, matter based on the tilt table test. Um, unfortunately, we in the past have done the same thing. We found people fainting fainting because their heart rate went down and then and that's called by the way a cardio inhibitory uh, process uh, when their when their car heart rate lessens and and when they got a pacemaker they still fainted because they got the other half the vasodepressor response which is a lowering of vasodilatation and a lowering of the blood pressure. So in these days, except for people over the age of 40, we're very loath to put in pacemakers for these uh, uh, syndromes. Um, and they really, most of them can be uh, well managed, um, including my own son who had uh, a, an eight minute um, um, asystole upon standing and, and three episodes of, um, of uh, syncope uh, who got away with medicine alone for a short time, medicine being salt and fluid, um, and he's an electrical engineer. So here's the typical tilt table test in a 77 year old man who had multiple disorders, just as, as Dr. Rowe had um, had mentioned there could be many reasons for patients to have 
a, a similar endpoint. So this person had a history of coronary disease with multiple stents. Some of those people uh, can faint if there's a cardiac ischemia. He had moderate aortic stenosis. Some of those people can, uh, can faint. And then he's driving along in his car <clears throat> and he faints. So um, we did a tilt table test on him and you can see the red line is his blood pressure and he starts out when he's standing up <clears throat> with pretty high blood pressure, systolic blood pressure. And then after um, um, the eight or eight obs eight, eighth observation, he drops his blood pressure precipitously, but at the exact same time, um, he drops his heart rate. Um, to a degree of asystole, which means no contractions. And as soon as he was put flat on the, on the tilt table, everything went back to normal, as Dr. Rose suggested. Here's a here's a, a uh, 18 year old college man who who um, basically w was uh, sent for me to do a tilt table test on because he had atypical seizures. And we did the test, and you can see all of a sudden those blips stop, and that's the heart stopping. And it doesn't start until 12 seconds later um, um, when we lie him down, and you can see the heart rate uh, uh, speed up. Sometimes you find weird things on the tilt table test. I'm not sure I can point this out. But in this tilt table test, look at this. A frame um, which is before uh, the patient was tilted. In this one, you see this business, this elevation of the ST segments, which is what you would see if the patient was having a heart attack or a temporary occlusion of a coronary artery. And he was laid flat, <clears throat> everything uh, went back to normal, and the thought was that he was having vasospasm. Um, and there's a whole li literature on spasm of the ventricle of the uh, vessels um, caused by uh, uh, these kinds of autonomic um, out, uh, outbursts. We've also seen um, ventricular tachycardia occur on these uh, tests uh, for the same reason. So who gets a, a, a tilt table test? Um, we do quite a number, over 200 tilt table tests a year, and it's uh, uh, going up dramatically actually over the past few years. About 14% uh, were pediatric patients, that, that's under the age of uh, 18, um, and they presented with a wide variety of symptoms, which I hope you can see up there, and they were referred by a, a wide variety of specialists. They have had symptoms for months to years with, without a correct diagnosis being made. Um, they have been seen by more than one caregiver. Many patients and their families voice disappointment and frustration with the medical care they receive and frequently feel that their caregiver, caregiver is either ill-equipped, dismissive of their seriousness, and just doesn't want to expend the effort required to manage the patients. And there are very few patients who, uh, very few doctors who have the wherewithal, the expertise and frustration tolerance to deal with people with these kinds of complex disorders adequately. What constitutes a tilt table test? Well, the patients are strapped to a, to a, a, a gurney, more or less, uh, that can be that can be levered up to about seventy percent uh, uh, angle, um, and we do blood pressures and pulse rates and pulse oximetry while they're laying flat, and then we ratchet them up to seven degree upright position, and uh, and they undergo that for as long as forty five minutes unless they faint. Um, and if they don't faint, then we have other tortures we can give to them, <laughs> which is usually the, we put them back down, we infuse uh, a drug like adrenaline, it's called isoproteranol, and we give them that, record their vital signs while they're getting the drug, supine, and then we tilt them up, and, um, and this is called a provocative agent. We tilt them up and um, give them 15 minutes of tilt with the isoproteranol um, um, being infused. Um, and uh, I'll show you in a minute 
what that can do is insofar as help us make the diagnosis. Now, since isoproteranol is like is like adrenaline, we don't like to give it in patient, patients with uh, um, coronary disease, aortic stenosis, or history of ventricular arrhythmia, uh, uncontrolled hypertension, uh, or high resting heart rate. Now, in that first 10 minutes of the first stage, we are also looking for POTS. So the whole, ep uh, the whole um, effort to identify POTS is the first 10 minutes on their initial tilt. And if they develop POTS, I still go ahead and do the entire tilt test unless they faint or, or drop their blood pressure significantly because sometimes POTS and neurally mediated hypotension or syncope coexist. Um, and it's nice to know uh, if that uh, if that happens. Now, POTS is, as Peter uh, said, I can spend the whole night here just quoting Peter's talk, which is what I'm doing. And, and POTS is diagnosed in people over the age of uh, uh, 19 uh, as an increase in heart rate of 30 beats per minute when they're put upright within the first 10 minutes of being put upright compared to what it was when they're down flat or the occurrence of a heart rate of 120 milli, uh, beats per minute while they're, while they're the first 10 minutes of upright um, uh, uh, position. For people who are teenagers, as uh, uh, Peter said, the heart rate increment has to be 40 beats per minute. Now, that leaves a part of our population that we uh, always shiver a little bit when we do the, the tilt table test on, and that's the children uh, younger than 12. Um, because they're, they got a, a heart rate of 90 when they're just jumping around ready for the test. So the, the criteria there are 40, 40 beat increment and, and at five minutes an increase and of heart rate to 130. So uh, that's a big uh, that's a big bounce, and not everybody has adopted that. And that's that's what uh, is that yellow um, um, asterisk uh, concerning. So it is is a little bit diff difficult uh, to make these diagnoses in children. But along with all these increments of uh, heart rate, we want to see some reproduction of their symptoms. And we're very loath to say somebody has POTS if they feel perfectly fine through the procedure, even though they had a 30 beat increment in their um, uh, heart rate. We like to see a reproduction of their symptoms. And, and, and neurally mediated hypotension is identified by a drop in um, uh, uh, heart rate by at least 30 uh, beats per minute or a drop in, in blood pressure of uh, more than or equal to or more than 20 millimeters of mercury, which is the new, uh, the, the new guidelines. Now, there is such a thing as orthostatic hy hypotension. Well, what that is, is neurally mediated hypotension as well, but it's not due to a vagal reflex at all. It's a direct um, loss of tone of the, uh, of the arteries. Um, and it's sometimes difficult to fitter out which which is orthostatic hypotension and which is neurally mediated hypotension when you're doing a tilt table test because they they respond in general uh, very very similarly. So the good news is um, the, the treatment's the same, and the most difficult treatment to do for for a, 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 any of these patients is patients who have high blood pressure when they're sitting or lying, and then they develop these problems when they stand up. That's a major challenge because most of what we do to help these people involves things that bring up the blood pressure, salt, fluid, um, or something like fluid cortisone, which retains salt. 
So here is the tilt table test. Um, you see it's usually done by a nurse. Uh, in, in our case, it's a, an electrophysiologic nurse because it's hard to get a doctor to sit there for an hour and a half. Um, but they're very, very good. And it's a very, very simple uh, procedure. We have everything there we need for a problem should it occur. Here's a, here's a uh, the diagnostic accuracy of this. How well is a tilt table test? How much can you rely on it to say that you have orthostatic intolerance, either uh, NMH or POTS? And, um, and it's, it's fair, it's acceptable, but it's not perfect. Um, and if we only do the upright tilt itself and stop there and not do the pr provocative um, test, that extra 15 minutes with either isoproteranol um, or, and I didn't mention this before, sometimes we give nitroglycerin if the, the, the patient is not a candidate for isoproteranol. Um, that's a tablet under the tongue uh, or so. Um, if you do that, you can see in, in, in the left-hand section the passive tilt table test without a provocative agent has a uh, pretty good specificity but a very poor uh, sensitivity. So it, it, you will underdiagnose this if you just do that. If you give either of these two, um, uh, two uh, provocative agents, you get an increase in overall diagnostic accuracy and a, um, a higher sensitivity. You'll find more people, but this comes at a cost of having more false positives. Okay, so you lose some of the specificity. Um, there are a lot of other tests that can be used to make a diagnosis of autonomic dysfunction, but they are rarely used uh, here. Here's a little something about POTS. First of all, we know very little about it, unfortunately. Somewhere between 500,000 and 3 million cases in the United States are known. And these are all the disorders that have been associated with it. Now, being associated with it doesn't mean it causes it. And, and, and being associated with it doesn't mean if you cure what the, the, the main problem, the identifiable associate is that your, your, um, your neurally needed, your dysautonomia will go away. And, and, and I think Peter's already uh, went there. And here's the va variation in symptoms of, of POTS. It's all over. It's every part of your body pretty much can have some sort of pre presenting uh, uh, symptom, which makes the, um, the, the diagnosis uh, more difficult. So some people have tried to find mechanisms the way uh, uh, what's causing POTS in an individual patient. Sometimes it's uh, attributed to flu volume, fluid, the volume of, of uh, intravascular fluid, dysregulation, abnormal vascular endothelial function, that is how it, the, the, the arteries and veins um, open and close uh, after being exposed to uh, autonomic in input. A neuropathy, that is disease of, of the nerves itself, hyperadrenergic state, and muscle pump state. By the way, if those of you who know people who faint from, from the, these disorders, they don't faint when they're running, if they're athletes. But as soon as they stop running, that's when they get lightheaded and faint. And the reason for that is the lower leg muscles can push up blood um, um, that accumulates in the lower part of your body, but in your legs uh, um, uh, pre predominantly in lower abdomen. So if you're using those muscles to pump, then you can return blood to the heart and, and you won't have these symptoms. And it's a big difference. Most people who develop symptoms are pretty much like standing in line, like that picture I showed you, or going to the grocery store and waiting to pay uh, the, the ca cashier a movie line, something like that. That's the, the big thing, because your legs can take over for a fair amount of what the, um, what, 
uh, what the neuro, uh, the um, the uh, um, autonomic nervous system is not doing correctly. And, and I will say, if you saw the picture of the tilt patient, we we strap their legs so they can't move. So. Um, we have people that fainted, never fainted before, but had pre-fainting kinds of things. And they didn't faint before because they sat down when they got these prodromal symptoms. Almost everybody who faints will feel funny before they faint. They feel like, geez, I, I'm lightheaded. I, I, you know, I'm unsta- I, I think I better sit down. And just doing that will usually prevent a, fa- a faint. Also, this kind of schema s- suggests specific therapies for each each uh, each uh, entity each mechanism that doesn't really work we don't we have limited therapies that we use and it doesn't seem to be that any one of them is any better now a lot of people in this country faint and in fact the fainting annual fainting rate is uh, between 18 and 40 per per thousand population every year. Of those, about uh, one in 10 see a doctor or a a medic. And of those, one in 10 get admitted to the hospital. And syncope is uh, uh, at a cost of uh, of a a huge amount of money uh, to the medical system each year, and it recurs frequently, unfortunately. Now the most common cause of syncope is vasodepressor syncope, and we can call it neurally mediated hypotension, um, or, uh, and, or orthostatic hypotension, and, and mixed into there is a vasovagal uh, induced, as opposed to what we're calling neurally mediated hypotension. Remember I made that that sometimes sometimes you can get a, a vagus nerve discharge from stimuli like straining or eating a big meal or swallowing um, um, a cold water. At any rate, syncope is a, a, a major a major problem for for uh, uh, our healthcare system. Now, here is uh, something that's usual that's a little bit debatable. We usually say people won't faint until the blood flow to their brain um, decreases, and that way we can make that determination when we measure just the blood pressure and the heart rate on the tilt table test. However, this group um, recently published cases in which there wasn't much of a change in the heart rate or the blood pressure. Matter of fact, there was no significant change, but there was a decrease in um, uh, flow to the brain. And why this occurs is uh, pretty interesting uh, and not well known. And I'm gonna get the hook out of here, uh, uh, but I want to tell you that there are, there are official American uh, Heart Association, uh, College of Cardiology and Heart Rhythm Society indications for tilt table testing for syncope. And you can see them here. Um, Now, there are no tilt, there are no guidelines for, for POTS, tilt table for POTS. And if you do a tilt table for the diagnosis of POTS, you may not be reimbursed by insurance. So um, we get around that um, as best we can. So there's certain benefits of a tilt table test. Um, when we, it evaluates not only for, uh, for neurally mediated hypotension, but both forms of neurally me- mediated hypotension, those caused primarily by a drop in blood pressure and those caused primarily by a drop in heart rate. And it also uh, obviously evaluates for POTS. Um, it gives a, 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 an immediate result, and patients like to know what they have right off the bat. Um, um, it uh, um, is less invasive than the alternative that's also often used for patients who faint, which is called an implantable loop recorder. It's a device like a tiny pacemaker that can be just slid under the skin and stay there for months or more. and it, records your heart rate and the only thing that'll uh, and if you push a button 
but just after you faint, it'll have that stored, that information stored, your heart rate when you did faint. And um, it's great if you faint from a low heart rate, but it's not so hot if you faint from a, a, a low blood pressure alone. So I'll just conclude that you don't need a tilt table test to really manage most patients with symptoms of, of normally mediated hypotension or POTS before you uh, initiate a management strategy. Um, no patient should be referred for, so what I'm saying is if you have a really good primary care person, they can start this off and figure it out themselves uh, uh, without any uh, a tilt table test. No patient should be referred for a tilt table test without careful and complete history and physical examination. Tilt table testing can be very helpful for the diagnosis in difficult cases and in some to direct specific therapy like a pacemaker. We need more physicians with an interest in autonomically mediated disorders to care for difficult patients. The physical and psychological burden that some of these uh, people endure is underappreciated by many uh, primary caregivers. Our understanding of these illnesses is incomplete and is progressing even as I speak. And the management strategies are all symptomatic, except perhaps for surgery for Chiari syndrome. But everything else we do is just to try to, to handle the symptoms. And, um, and they're empiric. That is, something sounds like it, we'll treat them for this. And if it works, that's what they had. And if it doesn't work, they don't have it. And, and that's good to fall back on, but it's, it's not really helpful in the long run. So next year, things will be better. Thank you.